Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because the Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, 
Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My friends, the Prince of Peace comes among us to settle us down and to offer us his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Please greet all that are in your house household with the sign of Christ's peace. Would you pray with me? O oh God, in you we live, in you we move, and in you we have our being. Grant us the ears to hear your word to us this day, the heart to receive it, the wisdom to understand it, and the courage to follow it. Amen. We can all agree that last week was a little weird, right? I'm not saying that it was bad. No, I thought it was wonderful. But as a whole, something felt off. And rather than wearing a specially planned suit and tie, I instead rolled up to the church in a leather jacket, jeans, sunglasses, and a black bandana around my face looking like a villain from The Walking Dead. Rather than walking into the church to find Lefty in the choir, already getting everything ready for our biggest Sunday of the year, I was the first one in the building. When I walked into the sanctuary at one point, I did not see or smell a single lily. And while we had over 500 people in the church last year, this year, there were only four of us. And it's quite possible that you joined the Easter service still in your pajamas, unshowered and with a gnarly case of bedhead. For some, it very well could have been the first Easter in decades that wasn't spent at a church. The first Easter where you didn't have lunch with your family, where you didn't hunt for eggs in the backyard. I think Bishop Michael Curry of the Episcopal Church said it best in his sermon last week. He said it's Easter Sunday. 
It doesn't look like it. It doesn't smell like it. It doesn't really feel like it. But it's Easter anyway. And Easter felt weird. Today we gather again to continue our celebration of this Easter season, and it all feels so strange yet again. In our words and music, we are still proclaiming the resurrection, but it is admittedly harder to see it in the face that is happening of everything around us. And Easter, Alleluia, is a bit harder to sing out when we're faced with a world that still seems to be stuck on Good Friday. In a time when we are in such need of resurrection, or at least in a time when I am in need of resurrection, it seems that it's hard to find. As is always the case for the Sunday after Easter, our reading this morning takes us to the story of Thomas. And I must admit that I have a bit of a soft spot for him. If you remember the ending of last week's reading, Mary Magdalene comes face to face with the risen Christ, and she goes to share the good news with the rest of the disciples. They don't seem to believe her, however, because they are cowering in a locked house in fear in the very next verse. It's not until Jesus physically appears to them, showing them his hands and his side and offering peace that they rejoice and believe. Thomas, however, has missed it, and we are not given any clues as to where he was. But he gets back later in that day to find the other disciples in a frenzy, saying that they have seen Jesus alive. Of course, to anyone who had not been in the room, this sounds absurd and impossible. And so Thomas sarcastically says, that he has to put his finger in Jesus' hand and his hand in his side to believe any differently because he knows that's not how life works. Yet there's something about this story that has always stood out for me. In our Bibles, it happens between verses 25 and 26, something that has to be read between the lines a little bit. Thomas does not believe his friends who are declaring that something miraculous has happened, but he still stays with them, a whole week, in fact. In the midst of mocking his friends for their absurd story, he still waits with them, even if he doesn't quite know what he's waiting for. Now there's a cynical part of me that says that he may just want to prove the other disciples wrong, but that, in the end, rings a little bit hollow. So let's go back to John 11, to the story of Lazarus. Jesus had just fled Judea to escape death at the hands of the people there, but now he tells his disciples that they are going back to Lazarus. And the disciples try to reason with him, telling him that it is far safer to remain where they are for just a little while longer, but Jesus is adamant. And it is Thomas who urges the other disciples to go with him to raise Lazarus, saying, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Even if it meant death, Thomas was ready to follow Jesus. And then let's jump to John 14, at the scene of the Last Supper, when Jesus is talking about his father's house that he is preparing, and Jesus says, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. And while the disciples were all confused, it is Thomas who speaks up. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Throughout the Gospel of John, Thomas is one of the disciples who shows faith in a way that the others do not and cannot. It is Thomas who seeks to follow regardless of the cost. And what I think I find happening in between those verses of our passage this morning is the reemergence of that faith. He knows that the resurrection could not have happened. It goes against everything he knows about the world and 
yet he finds something that goes much deeper than belief or unbelief, than confidence or absolute doubt. He refines a faith in the one that had brought him to this point. He lets himself be moved by that sliver of faith, compelled by that spark of hope. It's the work of at times simply showing up. Just like Mary showed up to the grave with her burial spices, he shows up to where his friends are. It's nothing drastic, not any expectations. All he's doing is staying with his friends for a few days. But it seems that it's just enough. Because after seven days of waiting and wondering why in the world he agreed to stay, Jesus comes to him. He offers himself so that Thomas can see the marks of the nails and can place his hands in his side. But Thomas really doesn't need that. He comes face to face with what he thought was the most absurd thing that could happen. His notions of what are real and possible are crumbling. And all that he is left with is the presence of the risen Christ. And in this moment, he manages to respond, my Lord and my God. There are times for us when Easter comes easy, and the idea of resurrection and joy is easy to find. But there are times, like now, when it can be hard to believe in Easter in this Good Friday world. And this Easter season in particular feels like we're in the space between those two verses. We find ourselves in that long week between first hearing the news of the resurrection and encountering it for ourselves. It feels weird, and it's going to feel weird for a while. And yet, there's always the opportunity to act like Mary and like Thomas and to just show up. Not physically, of course. Please, stay home. But, even as we hear songs that right now may seem out of touch with reality, and as we watch yet another worship service from our couches, before us is the opportunity to show up and open ourselves to the wonder of grace and love, to the possibility of resurrection happening even in the smallest moments. Because the good news is that Jesus is risen whether or not we feel like celebrating it. Resurrection is happening now, even if we do not initially see it. And we wake up each morning to an empty tomb, even if our church is just as empty. In the midst of this pandemic, of social distancing and of quarantine, it is still Easter. And so, my friends, let us hold on to the faith that sooner or later the risen Christ will appear to us too. And it may take a while for us to notice him. And those signs of resurrection life may seem insignificant. But Jesus comes to us, breaking through our locked doors to offer us his peace. And that will make all of the difference. Thanks be to God.
gathered as the people of God in this place. Let us pray together. I will end each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, and ask you to respond in your homes or wherever you are with hear our prayer. God of the empty tomb, thank you for your word that gives us life. Your word that lifts our soul. Your word that reminds us of your deep longing to be with us. To meet us wherever we are and end in our places of need. You are willing to break down walls and travel through locked doors and all the barriers we erect around ourselves, shutting you out and shutting others out. Thank you for reminding us that you are not bound by place or space or time. Lord, in your mercy. You desire to give us peace that surpasses understanding, the kind of peace that helps us to forgive, to let things go, peace that surpasses our anxieties and fears, the weariness of life and the wounds that keep us trapped. You desire to give us peace that allows us to rise up out of decay and live, really live with ourselves and in communion with others. Break through on us, Lord Christ, that we might break through on all those things that have us bound. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick those suffering from COVID-19 around the world, those sick with cancers, diabetes, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease and every disease, those sick by poverty, hatred, indifference, pride, stubbornness, spirit of entitlement, and I just don't care. Pray for those who are struggling for breath in this moment, who cannot breathe on their own. We breathe for them. And as we do so, we remember how precious each breath is, how many breaths we take for granted. Breathe on them. And breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Breathe on Verdelia and Lorenz, Tom and Cindy and Karen, Meryl, Sandy, Norman, and all of those we hold in our hearts. For you know each of us by name, and you love us all. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are on the front lines caring for others during this pandemic. Doctors, nurses, health care providers, administrators. And also for those who are less recognized, but without whom many more would die those who clean the hospitals, who cook the food, who drive buses and cabs and Ubers and trains, police officers, sanitation workers, mail carriers, grocery store clerks and pharmacists, those who work in warehouses packaging the items we think we need to keep going, teachers, parents, and children, May your mercy be great upon them and your blessings overflow. Like Thomas, we wonder what will happen next, how we will make it forward. 
We have faith, but we also have doubt. We cannot always see our way in the dark, and we yearn for signs of your presence, something to see, touch, and feel in order that our belief might be renewed. Open our eyes to the small things, and the moments that are holy and precious and available all around us. Remind us that we have been raised to new life, that love is the way and opportunities abound, and that even death cannot hold the grip of your love for us or your movements of grace. We ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And so, friends, as you close the browser window, as you log off from Facebook, may you be reminded of that doubt, that unbelief is part of this journey. It's part of what it means to be Christian. And I would dare say that if you haven't had moments of doubt, maybe you're not paying attention. But the journey of faith is something in which we move past that doubt. We move into something deeper, something more hopeful, something more absurd. But I firmly and strongly believe with all that I am that when we go through this life with that faith, we will begin to see the proof around us. We'll see the world differently. We'll see each other differently. We'll see ourselves differently. And so my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make her face shine upon you. May the arms of Christ wrap around you in love and may you live in the peace of the resurrected Christ. 
Amen.